Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I wanted to walk you through how to underpin a basement or essentially lower the floor in a basement to create more living space. This can be hugely advantageous if we want to take a basement and create a basement apartment, but there's not enough ceiling height. And how we create more ceiling height in the basement instead of having to take the house down or repour a new foundation is we underpin. So we basically drop the floor in the basement in order to create more space. Now, before you go any further, I want to make sure that I mention three things. If you're doing any structural work to your house, please make sure that you hire a structural engineer to oversee the project. You also wanna apply for building permits and make sure that you have inspections along the way and that you have the right approvals in order to be able to do any work that you wanna do on your property. And also make sure you notify your insurance company because your insurance company may have a stipulation in the agreement with them that says that you have to notify them when you're doing any structural work to the home. So now with all of that out of the way, let me walk you around and show you what's going on in this project and talk you through underpinning and how it gets done a property. So the first thing you'll notice is that the underpinning contractors have gone around the foundation wall, the perimeter, and they've marked out sections. Uh, and these will be sections that will be stipulated by the engineer on the drawings. And they're usually in three to four foot sections and the numbers indicate when you're going to dig and then pour each section of the underpinning. So right now they've only marked out the number ones and you can see that all the way around the foundation they've marked these number one sections that are going to get uh, excavated, underpinned, and then poured. So what we do is we go in and we dig out three to four foot sections, but those sections are six to eight feet apart. So we have six or eight feet of foundation that's still intact, and then we can remove that three or four foot section, pull out the dirt from underneath the footing, pour the concrete in, and then the next step is to come in and remove the next section all the way around the foundation. So you can see that's what's been done here. They essentially knocked out a section of the concrete floor, and then they dug down, and then they dug back. So that goes back about two feet, um, or 18 inches, which is the foundation thickness. So you have to get underneath the entire foundation, dig all the way back, and then you go all the way down. And I have to say, this is one of the cleanest underpinning job sites I've ever seen, but I really like the way that they knock out the concrete, keep the slab intact for the most part, take each little section, and then that keeps the structural integrity of the slab in place and also keeps the structural integrity of the foundation walls while they just take out these little sections. So once the section ones have been dug out and inspected by the engineer to say that they've gone down far enough and back far enough to support the footings, now we get to form the footings and then pour concrete into those sections. So the forms are put in place to hold back the concrete because when they pour that concrete in there, they're going to vibrate it to make sure that it gets all of the air bubbles out and that it fills all the pockets. But in order to be able to do that, the vibration of the concrete causes a lot of force. So these footings have to be pinned back to make sure that they don't move while we're pouring the concrete. There's a couple ways that you can underpin a basement. What they've done here is they've done a flush pour. And that means that they're gonna pour the concrete flush in line with the existing foundation. You can also do a step foundation, so that would come out a little bit from the existing foundation and widen it a little bit. Um, and there's also different ways of pouring the concrete as well. You can either do an over pour or you can pour a couple inches short of the existing foundation wall and you can fill that gap with what's called non-shrink grout. So in our case, they did a flush pour. So when we're done, this will all be one flush wall. And they use the over pour method because that was what the engineer suggested and it's actually a better way of doing underpinning. And how you know which method you're gonna use, whether that's a flush pour or a step footing, um, whether that's an over pour you're gonna fill with non-shrink grout, that's all stipulated on your drawings from your engineer and all stamped by the city so that you know exactly which way you can tell your contractor that everything needs to be done. Now, as you can imagine, there's a lot of dirt that comes out of each one of these individual holes. And the biggest part of underpinning is figuring out how to get the dirt out of the foundation. In our case, it was relatively easy because we have access to the backyard and they were able to get the bins right at the back of the house. And then they knocked a hole in the back wall of the foundation and brought the machinery right in. I'm back for phase two of our underpinning project at Oak Mount. And the phase one sections have been poured. And I wanted to show you guys what it looks like after the section ones have been poured. And then the forms have been removed and section two has been done dug out and is ready for inspection and forming and concrete. So you can see here, this is a really good indication of what a section one looks like and what a section two looks like. So section one has been poured 
and um, now stripped of the, of the uh, forms. You'll also see that the, this was stripped. So there was that 45 degree angle on the form uh, that the concrete overpour was uh, part of. And then they just chip it off so that it's flush with the wall. Now it's not perfectly flush, but when we go to frame, you know, we might be able to frame an inch off the existing wall, which is not a big deal. Right beside the section one, you'll see section two is dug out and ready for pour. And then beside that, you'll see the section three, which still remains. So we've got the structure from section one now being poured. The dirt from section three still remains. And now the only thing that's been opened up are the section twos. So this is why the foundation is still very much intact because we've got one section in concrete, one section open and one section in dirt. But on the left side here, you'll see that that's gonna be uh, resting up against uh, the sand in, in section two. And on the right side, we'll now have concrete to concrete. So you can tell that they cleaned that off um, so that the concrete will form against the other section. So that's a pretty good look at a section. And you'll see all the way around the perimeter of the basement, we've essentially got section one poured, section two dug out, section one poured, section two dug out, section three still intact. So you'll see the main drain line here. And that's the sewage line going out um, to the city side to connect to the main sewer. So we'll keep that exposed um, so that we can work on it if we need to and we'll fill it in after the fact. And then this is the water service that's coming in here, but we're gonna get new water service at this property. So that'll eventually be dropped down and probably brought in with a new plumbing service. So depending on your underpinning contract, they may use various uh, forms of machinery or they might just do it by hand. Uh, this company that we have hired uses a lot of machines and it's very effective and, and that's why they were able to move so quickly. But I wanted to show you some of the machines that they're using um, because for me, you know, I did this by hand when I decided to do my basement and it took a long time to be able to dig out each section. But when they've got machinery and you can do it, uh, it's definitely a lot faster. So let me show you some of the equipment they're using. So this is the, uh, the newest toy. I think that um, we might have paid for this <laughs> based on our two job sites we have going on right now. But this is a little ride along on the back that they use to remove dirt. And then they've got the small excavator here, which as you can see, they use to remove the dirt. They put it on the, the concrete floor here and this other machine comes and grabs it. And then what they do is they take it all to the back here and they pile it at the back exit. And then the other excavator outside grabs it from here, throws it in the bins and they just keep exchanging out the bins. So it's a pretty efficient process and this is why they've been able to move so quickly. In these sections here though, this does need to be dug out by hand, at least finished up. But you'll see that it's sand base here, so it's really easy to remove most of the dirt. Hey everybody, I'm back at our Oak Mount project. Uh, phase three of our underpinning is complete. Phase one was poured, phase two was poured, phase three was poured, the forms have been removed and now the entire perimeter of the property is underpinned. At this point, we can go in and remove the center section of the basement. So we can take up the slab and we can start to remove the dirt because now the entire perimeter uh, footings have been dropped down to the level that they're going to end up at. We weren't able to remove a center section of the basement because this house is really wide and we've got a load bearing wall right down the middle. And I'll show you how we work with that and how we deal with that if you've got a really wide basement that you're underpinning. So you'll see now that we have underpinned all three sections sections. The darker sections are the ones that were poured last and they're still curing a little bit. It's really cold here right now. But you'll see this wall here is a really good indicator of where the floor height used to be and what we've gained in floor height now. So that wall is suspended kind of in midair. Uh, it's obviously not picking up any structure, otherwise we wouldn't have removed what's underneath it. You really get an indication too of how high these windows are gonna be. Now, we're coming up a foot from uh, where I'm standing right now. So we've got six inches of gravel, which will essentially line up with the, uh, the footing that we put in. Then we've got two inches of insulation and then four inches of concrete. So we're coming up a full foot from where we are, but we'll end up with about nine foot ceilings down here. But let me spin around and show you what it looks like. The center section can't be removed yet because it's load bearing. But once we put these temporary support posts in, we can then remove all of this center section, including this brick wall. We put our strip footing down the middle 
and we can then restructure the framing to be able to open up this entire space. I haven't been shooting much video back here, but this is the addition that was done to the property. And you'll see that we've uh, underpinned this section as well. We haven't removed the floor yet because they'll do this last. Uh, they're about to blast out this wall right here once we get the structure figured out. And they'll also be blasting out this entire back wall to put in the addition. But you'll see here that uh, the underpinning is done in this section. I'm guessing they're leaving this section because they're going to be tying in uh, the new foundation wall, so they'll do that at the same time. Somebody asked me why we did the bench footing in this underpin. The bench footing wasn't necessary, but the reason we put the bench footing in was because we can set a structural two by four wall on that bench footing now and uh, pick up the load for our floor joists. So if we didn't have the bench footing in, we restrict our options. So by putting the bench footing in, we can either pick up the structure of the floor joist with a structural two by four studded wall, or you can see here, these joists are actually pocketed into the brick, but with the bench footing that gives us multiple options um, and it gives the engineer an opportunity to decide whether we want to put in a structural two by four wall or whether we want to pocket the floor joists in and set them on the foundation. So the last time that I was here, there was a big brick wall sitting here on a big mound of dirt in the center of the property. And the reason that we've been able to remove that brick wall now is because we were able to put in these temporary jack posts and the temporary jack posts are then picking up the structure above that, the load above that. So we've been able to remove that entire brick wall and take out all of the remaining dirt in the basement. You can also see that we've been able to remove the entire back wall of the house and be able to put in our new foundation extension. So as you can see, we've been able to take out all of the brick, all the structure that was sitting down on this foundation wall, and therefore that back wall of the house was able to easily be removed because there was nothing sitting on top of it now. You'll also see that all the plumbing has been completed now in the basement, and I wanted to show everyone this, which is our backflow prevention valve. So in the case of a sewer backup on the main line, this protects all of the basement fixtures from backing up. Now normally you'll see that back backup preventer on the main sewer line as it comes into the house. But the reason why we didn't put it on the main line is because we're going to have suites in the basement here, one on this side and one over on this side. If we had a backflow preventer on the main line here, what would happen is that if that backed up, that would essentially block this main line. And then if people upstairs were flushing their toilets and everything that would back up into the basement. So instead of having a main line, when you have suites in the basement, you need to do it on each individual fixture for the basement apartments. And that's what we've done here. There's a backflow valve here and a backflow valve on this side as well. You'll also see that the interior waterproofing has been complete. This is a Delta membrane that goes on the inside of the wall so that if water penetrates through the foundation, it hits that membrane, goes all the way down to the foundation, and then it goes right into the weeping tile system. The weeping tile system goes all the way around the perimeter and then it empties into a sump pit. And then the sump pit ejects the water to the exterior. And the reason why we do it on the inside is because the foundation is all exposed and we can do this all the way around the interior of the perimeter as opposed to doing it on the exterior. I wanted to point out one more thing, and that is that we have a strip footing going right down the middle of the property. And now the strip footing is there so that we can set a structural two by six wall down the center of the property. And then that will essentially pick up all of the load from the floor joists above that. I'm not exactly sure how they're going to pour around these temporary support posts, but I'm guessing they'll block them off and then they'll pour around them and then they'll come back and fill in after the fact once the concrete has cured and we're able to put our support wall in place and pick up all the structure above. So this is where the old back wall of the original house was and then there was an addition put on at some point. So we've underpinned all of that and we've now tied in our foundation extension. So our foundation extension is about 12 feet and then the reason that it drops down back here is because this is where the walkout will be. So you'll be able to walk out the back door and then up the steps and out the back of the property. Hey, I'm back at our Oakmount project and I wanted to just quickly show you guys what's going on here because tomorrow we're pouring concrete. But before we do that, I wanna show you what things look like 
on the floor because the insulation is now in, the radiant heating pipes are in, they're pressurized and we're ready to pour concrete and finish up the underpin. So as you can see, the radiant floor pipes have been laid down on the two inches of rigid foam insulation. And those radiant floor pipes go all the way out and around. They're in different zones. And what that means is about 200 linear feet of pipe will control one zone. Now that's all gonna be on one single thermostat, but each room is zoned differently. And all of those pipes lead back over here. And there'll be a manifold here that will connect all of these radiant heating floor pipes. Now, radiant heating is not required in um, a basement underpin, but it is a great value add if you're doing a underpin and you've got the ability, it's probably just as easy to run the pipes even if you don't use them. Um, it's great to have them there just in case. So wanted to show you exactly what this looks like with all of the insulation in and the radiant pipes in and we're ready to pour concrete tomorrow. While we pour the concrete on the floor, we're actually gonna keep the radiant in-floor pipes pressurized. We're gonna have about 60 PSI on the pipes so that if any one of them was to get nicked or burst, uh, we would immediately know that and we can stop the pour of the concrete, fix that pipe, and then keep going. The last thing we wanna do is pour all this concrete over these radiant heating pipes and then one of them is leaking or burst and we don't know about it. So that's why we keep them pressurized during the pour of the concrete. Hey everybody, I'm back at our Oak Mount project for our final walkthrough of our underpinning project. I wanted to show you the concrete slab now that it's poured and everything is complete. So as you can see, the concrete slab has been poured and our underpin is complete. We have a final finished floor that we can now work off of. These temporary support posts are here just until we get our wall built. But the footing is sitting underneath here, so there's gonna be a two by six structural wall that goes into place here. And then once that wall is in place, we can remove those temporary support posts and fill in the concrete sections that are filled with water right now because it's been raining for the last couple of days. We left this section open because we need to run our new water service into the house still. So we left this little four by four section of concrete to be poured. And you can see this is where the in-floor heating pipes will be. It'll be in the closets and we'll have the manifolds here for them. We now have eight and a half foot ceilings. We started with uh, just under seven. And so now we've got full height on the basement ceilings and decent um, height towards our windows. Sometimes when you underpin, the windows seem a little bit odd because they're up so high, but uh, these won't seem that weird. And we can always dig down these front windows and drop them a little bit more because we could put in some window wells, but we'll see how that goes. But here's the finished product of our underpin. So the question that everyone keeps asking me is what is the cost of doing an underpin project of this nature? And it's really pretty simple. Every contractor is gonna have a different pricing. But what I'm seeing that's pretty consistent is around $400 per linear foot. So a linear foot being a linear foot of your foundation wall. So in this case, our linear footage uh, worked out to about $56,000 for the underpin. That $56,000 included uh, digging out the sections and underpinning. It also included the gravel that we put in and then pouring the new concrete pad. It did not include the radiant floor heat in the $56,000. So the cost is really gonna depend on how easily accessible the site is. Really, it's how quickly and, and effectively they can get dirt out and concrete back in. In terms of the timeline, this project's taken us a little bit longer than we would like, but it should take around uh, four to eight weeks to complete an entire underpin. Ours was a little bit longer because it was a little bit of complexity with adding the addition um, and doing that. Uh, so that's why it took a little bit longer. I hope this video was helpful walking you through the entire process of an underpin. I know it would have been helpful for me if I had a video like this when I was trying to do my very first project. So if it was helpful for you, do me a favor, go ahead and hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave me comments and questions below. If you got a technical question about an underpin that you're looking at, I'd be happy to answer it to the best of my knowledge. And with that, I'll say thank you so much for watching. I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey, and I look forward to hearing your success stories very soon.